There are planes that change the world. Planes that carry thousands of people every day. Planes that broke records. And then there are the ones that made people ask, what were they thinking? Engines that ran on nuclear power. Wings that twisted mid-flight. Jets so small they had to be dropped from bombers. And a few that looked more like UFOs than anything built on Earth. These weren't sci-fi ideas. They were real. They were flown. And most of them barely worked. But every one of them tells a story. Of ambition, of failure, and of what happens when engineers go too far. These are the most outrageous experimental planes that almost took off. It looked like a flying saucer. It flew like a frisbee. And somehow, it worked. This is the Vought V-173, better known as the Flying Pancake. An experimental US Navy aircraft designed in the 1940s with one goal in mind, to revolutionize the way planes took off and landed. Most aircraft rely on long runways and streamlined wings, but the V-173 was different. Its entire body was a wing, a flat circular lifting surface that could generate massive amounts of lift, even at low speeds. The design was meant to allow it to take off from the deck of an aircraft carrier in a fraction of the usual distance. It had two huge propellers mounted on either side of the cockpit, spinning so fast they looked like blurs. When you saw it in the air, it looked more like a UFO than a Navy project. And yet, it flew. It flew well. Test pilots flew over 190 successful flights between 1942 and 1943. Charles Lindbergh himself even took it for a spin and described the controls as light and responsive. But as impressive as it was, the flying pancake was doomed by timing. Jet engines were just arriving, and suddenly, low-speed agility wasn't the future anymore. Still, the V-173 was a real aircraft. It's in a museum now. And for a brief moment, the US Navy seriously considered putting pancakes in the sky. The Cold War gave us some insane aircraft, but few were as bold, or as bizarre, as this one. This is the Bartini Berea VVA-14, a Soviet amphibious aircraft designed in the 1970s to do one thing, hunt American submarines, from the sky. But it wasn't just a seaplane, it was an Akronoplan hybrid, meant to skim just above the surface of the ocean, using ground effect, like a hovercraft with wings. It had vertical takeoff capability, inflatable pontoons, and a fuselage that looked like a futuristic missile silo. On paper, it was unstoppable. In reality, it was a mechanical nightmare. The VVA-14 required an absurd number of engines, some for flight, some just for liftoff, and others to support its hovering effect. It was supposed to fly low over the sea at high speed, detecting and attacking NATO submarines before they could even surface. Only two prototypes were ever built. One flew, sort of. It could take off from water and land again, but the vertical takeoff system was never completed. And after the death of its lead designer, Robert Bartini, the project stalled out and faded away. But for a brief moment, the Soviets seriously considered covering the ocean with flying sea monsters like this one. In the 1950s, the U.S. Air Force had an idea that sounds more like a Bond villain's plan than a real-world proposal. What if a bomber never had to land? What if it could fly non-stop for months, circling the globe, always ready to strike? The key? A nuclear reactor, on board. This was the concept behind the Convair X-6, a long-range strategic bomber powered not by jet fuel, but by atomic energy. The plan was to build a plane that could stay in the air indefinitely, immune to refueling needs, and capable of delivering nuclear payloads at a moment's notice. One small issue, putting a nuclear reactor on a plane is insanely dangerous. The project got surprisingly far. A modified Convair B-36 was built and flown, called the NB-36H, with a working reactor on board. It didn't power the engines, but it proved you could carry one through the air. It was heavily shielded, had lead-lined walls, and the cockpit was encased in a six-ton rubber and lead pod. Test pilots flew it wearing dosimeters to monitor radiation exposure. Eventually, reality caught up. The idea of flying around with a nuclear reactor 
day and night over populated areas was just too dangerous. The risks of a crash, spreading radioactive debris across the countryside, were too high. By 1961, the project was canceled, not because it failed, but because it came far too close to actually happening. Someone at NASA had an idea. What if the plane flew diagonally and somehow they got funding? This is the AD-1, a strange little test jet with an even stranger wing. Instead of staying fixed, the entire wing could rotate up to 60 degrees mid-flight, shifting the aircraft into a skewed sideways configuration. It was called an oblique wing and the theory behind it was solid. At high speeds, a swept wing reduces drag especially as you approach or exceed the speed of sound. By pivoting the wing in flight, the AD-1 could stay efficient across different speeds, at least in theory. But the AD-1 had a problem, actually several. For one, it was underpowered. It never flew fast enough to benefit from the drag reduction the oblique wing was supposed to provide. And at those slower subsonic speeds, rotating the wing did more harm than good. Above 45 degrees, the aircraft became unstable. The airflow separated, buffeting increased, and the controls, already sensitive, started to lag and oscillate. Pilots described it as disorienting, physically uncomfortable, and hard to manage. Flying it felt like you were being pulled in two directions, the nose pointing one way, the wing fighting another. NASA got the data it needed, but it was clear the design wasn't ready. In the end, the AD-1 proved a concept, but it also proved that some theories only work when the math and the machine catch up. It looked like a UFO, and for a while, the US military hoped it might fly like one too. This was the Avro VZ-9 Avrocar, Canada's Cold War era attempt at building a real, operational flying saucer, designed in secret, funded by the US Air Force, and shaped like a silver disc straight out of science fiction. It was a VTOL aircraft, a vertical takeoff and landing machine, meant to hover like a helicopter, fly like a jet, and confuse enemy radar all at once. At its core was a massive central fan, powered by jet engines, which blew air downward and out the sides to generate lift. In theory, it could hover, transition to forward flight and reach speeds over 480 kilometers per hour. In practice, it could barely get off the ground. The Avro car suffered from instability at low altitudes and became nearly uncontrollable above just a few feet. Engineers discovered a phenomenon called hubcapping, where the aircraft wobbled violently in all directions, like a spinning plate losing balance. It was loud, underpowered, and nearly impossible to steer. After two prototypes and millions of dollars, the project was scrapped. It never flew more than one meter off the ground and never came close to battlefield use. But as far as experimental aircraft go, the Avro car was one of the most outrageous things ever built. And for a brief moment, the dream of a flying saucer almost, almost took off. It looked like something out of science fiction. A sharp, triangular jet with no tail, no cockpit dome, and no clear reason to exist. This was the Northrop XP-79, a rocket-powered flying wing built during World War II with a very strange control system. You flew it with your feet. The XP-79 was designed as an interceptor, meant to slice through enemy bomber formations at high speed. Its thin wings and magnesium alloy frame made it incredibly fast and lightweight. And its intended weapon? The plane itself. It was designed to ram enemy aircraft mid-air, shearing off tails or wings without using a single bullet. And because of that role, it had no traditional stick or yoke. The pilot lay prone in the cockpit, flat on their stomach, steering with a foot control system to better withstand G-forces. But the project never made it to combat. On its first powered flight in 1945, the XP-79 lost control during a maneuver, entered a spin, and crashed. The test pilot, Harry Crosby, was unable to bail out in time and was killed. The program was canceled immediately. It was a strange, daring, and ultimately doomed experiment, one that pushed the limits of what a fighter jet could be. 
and paid the price. Not all of these planes worked. Most barely made it off the ground. Some never should have. But that's the nature of experimental flight. You try something insane, push it too far, and learn something no simulator or spreadsheet ever could have taught you. These prototypes were messy, dangerous, and sometimes flat out ridiculous, but each one chipped away at the unknown, because flight doesn't move forward by playing it safe. It moves forward when someone says, what if we flew sideways? What if it didn't need fuel? What if it wasn't a plane at all? Most of the time those ideas fail, but every now and then they don't. And suddenly the plane that shouldn't have flown becomes the one that takes us somewhere new.